first time that I've been in the pulpit for two months. So I'm a little bit squeaky today, a little rusty. That's the end of my message. No. It is, uh, it, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, I don't know, what is it? It's old age. It's old age and new glasses. We're continuing in our series in Joshua. I'm glad to be here this morning, and I'm glad that you're here. We're looking in Joshua. We've been in this series for a couple of weeks now, and we're going to work our way through Joshua over the next few weeks. And uh, today we're in Joshua chapter 7, so you can turn there, and uh, we'll catch up to that in just a moment. If you've got your digital version or you've got your book, uh, open it up there. I want to tell you about a story about a scientist who was unjustly accused and convicted of a major crime and found himself sentenced to hard time at a prison in the, in the Arizona desert. His cellmate turned out to be another scientist. Determined that he was going to escape, this first man tried to convince his colleague, this other scientist, to make the attempt with him, but the other guy refused. After some careful planning, the first guy made his escape, and before long, the heat of the desert, the lack of food and water and complete disorientation in the hostile wilderness almost drove him mad. So he was soon forced to return to prison. He reported this terrible experience to the other scientists who surprised him by saying, yes, I know, I tried too, and I failed to for the same reasons that you're talking about. Well, this first guy, I mean, he's like incensed. If, if you knew what was out there and you knew what I was gonna experience, why didn't you tell me what was out there? And this other scientist responded by saying with a shrug, who publishes negative results? I mean, we don't, we don't wanna broadcast our failures to people that are around us. There's a little bit of truth in this story. See, in the church, and I'm talking about the church as a whole, not just New Hope, not New Hope specifically, uh, but the church as a whole, we don't talk about some things much anymore. We don't talk about sin a lot. But here at New Hope, we're committed to telling things like it is as best as we can. So today we're talking about sin. I also want to mention that we've got our mass service that's going on at 9.30. I'm just remembering that I forgot that in my notes. That's probably what I was searching for. There was something else. Welcome all of you who are joining us in the auditorium. Will you just give a welcome to all those who are joining us in the auditorium for this service right now live. So we love you all and we're glad that you are here with us as well. So, sin. Not something that we talk about. Not something that we like to talk about. Not something that we like to hear about. But if we ignore it, then we condemn others to make the same mistakes and suffer hardship. So today we're looking at Joshua chapter 7, a very blunt chapter about sin and the consequences of sin. So here's some context. The Israelites have crossed, in, crossed the Jordan and they've begun the conquest of the, of the promised land. Last week, Pastor Luke talked uh, about Rahab, the prostitute in Jericho, and how she helped the spies of the Israelites and, and saved them. And in turn, they saved her when Jericho uh, was taken over, when Jericho, uh, the walls of Jericho came down. And uh, that led to the epic victory of one of the greatest, most famous battles that were ever fought, and that's Joshua and the Israelites and the great battle of Jericho that Pastor Weaver shared about last Sunday night. Go back and watch that if you, if you haven't seen that. We restarted our Sunday evening services last Sunday. Tonight, Pastor Kerry is going to be talking on Joshua chapter 3 and the, the necessity for us to consecrate ourselves before the Lord. So we're going to be having a time of worship. He's going to share. and We're going to take some time to pray. Pray for our church. Pray for our community. Pray for our nation. Pray that God would help us. God would restore us. But before the Israelites ever crossed the Jordan, we go back to chapter one, God promised them, God had promised them victory. And he promised to be with them every step of the journey. Listen to this, Joshua 1, 7, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Verse nine, this is my command, be strong and courageous. This is, this is God toward Joshua. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And Joshua challenges his leaders. And this is 
what he says to them. And uh, he challenges them. And they answer to Joshua in verse 16. They said, we will do whatever you command us. And we will go wherever you send us. We will obey you just as we obeyed Moses. And may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Now listen to this, verse 18. Anyone who rebels against your orders and does not obey your words and everything you command will be put to death. That's some serious stuff. They're saying, look, Joshua, you're our leader. You hear from God, and whatever you tell us, we'll do. Wherever you lead us, that's where we'll go. And anybody that does not follow your orders and your commands will be put to death. That's some pretty serious consequences, but they're serious about what they're doing. So today, as we look at chapter 7, something goes desperately wrong with the Israelites. As we read this chapter, we're going to find out what was and what we can learn from it in our lives today. So chapter 7, we're going to read through this chapter. Bear with me. You can see it on the screens if you don't have one of your devices or, or Bibles available. But this is what it says, but Israel, but. Most of your versions start with the word but, a three little conjunction word that says something, things have changed. We just had the victory in Jericho. They marched around the city and the walls came down. They experienced incredible victory and they they went in and took the whole city. But Israel violated the instructions about the things set apart for the Lord. A man named Achan had stolen some of the dedicated things so the Lord was very angry with the Israelites. Achan was the son of Carmi, a descendant of Zimri, son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah. Joshua sent some of his men from Jericho to spy out the town of Ai, east of Bethel, near Beth Haven. And when they returned, they told Joshua, there's no need for all of us to go up there. It won't take more than two or 3,000 men to attack Ai. Since there are so few of them, don't make all of our people struggle to go up there. So approximately 3,000 warriors were sent, but they were soundly defeated. The men of Ai chased the Israelites from the town gate as far as the quarries, and they killed about 36 who were retreating down the slope. The Israelites were paralyzed with fear at this turn of events, and their courage melted away. Joshua and the elders of Israel tore their clothing in dismay, threw dust on their heads, and bowed face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord until evening. And then Joshua cries out this prayer, O sovereign Lord, why did you bring us across the Jordan River if you were going to let the Amorites kill us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side. Lord, what can we say now that Israel has fled from its enemies For when the Canaanites and all the other people living in the land hear about this, they will surround us and wipe out our name off the face of the earth. And then what will happen to the honor of your great name? Things have changed. But the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why are you lying face down like this? Israel has sinned and broken my covenant. They have stolen some of the things that I commanded must be set apart for me. And they have not only stolen them, but they have lied about it and hidden the things among their own belongings. That is why the Israelites are running from their enemies in defeat. For now Israel itself has been set apart for destruction. I will not remain with you any longer unless you destroy the things among you that were set apart for destruction. Get up, command the people to purify themselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, hidden among you, O Israel, are things set apart for the Lord. You will never defeat your enemies until you remove these things from among you. And in the morning you must present yourselves by tribes, and the Lord will point to the tribe to which the guilty man belongs. And the tribe must come forward with its clans, and the Lord will point out the guilty clan. And the clan will then come forward, and the Lord will point out the guilty family. And finally, each member of the guilty family must come forward one by one. The one who has stolen what was set apart for destruction will himself be burned with fire along with everything he has, for he has broken the covenant of the Lord and has done a terrible thing in Israel. So early the next morning, Joshua brought the tribes of Israel before the Lord, and the tribe of Judah was singled out. And the clans of Judah came forward, and the clan of Zerah was singled out. And the families of Zerah came forward, and the family of Zimri was singled out. And every member of Zimri's family was brought forward person by person, and Achan was singled out. And then Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, by telling the truth. Make your confession and tell me what you have done. Don't hide it from me. Achan replied, it's true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. Among the plunder, 
I saw a beautiful robe from Babylon, 200 silver coins, and a bar of gold weighing more than a pound. I wanted them so much, and I took them. They are hidden in the ground beneath my tent with the silver buried deeper than the rest. So Joshua sent some men to make a search. They ran to the tent and found stolen goods hidden there, just as Achan had said, with the silver buried beneath the rest. And they took the things from the tent and brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites, and they laid them on the ground in the presence of the Lord. And then Joshua and all the Israelites took Achan, the silver, the robe, the bar of gold, his sons, daughters, cattle, donkeys, sheep, goats, tent, and everything that he had. And they brought them to the valley of Acre. And then Joshua said to Achan, why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will now bring trouble on you. And all the Israelites stoned Achan and his family and burned their bodies. They piled a great heap of stones over Achan, which remains to this day. That is why they call the place, why that place has been called the Valley of Trouble ever since. So the Lord was no longer angry. So verse one gives us the plot of this chapter and and the basic plot is that Achan had sinned. And then the rest of the chapter provides us with the details. But to understand what is happening here, we need to go back to chapter six, verse 17 to 19. And at that point, the Israelites are marching around Jericho on the seventh day. And you know that they went around not just once every day, the first six days, but on the seventh day, they went around seven times. And as they were going around the seventh time, this is what Joshua says to the Israelites. Jericho and everything in it must be completely destroyed as an offering to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and the others in her house will be spared for she protected our spies. Do not take any of the things set apart for destruction. This was the orders as they were getting ready to go in and the walls came down. Do not take any of the things set apart for destruction or you yourselves will be completely destroyed and you will bring trouble on the camp of Israel. Everything made from silver, gold, bronze, and iron is sacred to the Lord and must be brought into the treasury. You see, Joshua gave clear instructions. He gave a fair warning about the plunder of the city of Jericho. But one man, one man named Achan, sinned by stealing from the Lord. But Joshua doesn't understand any of that at this point. So Joshua, as they, as they took the city of Jericho, simply continues the, the, the conquest of the promised land by sending some spies up to the next city. And the report is that Ai, this small town, uh, after what they had experienced in Jericho, they're coming back saying, this is an easy target, easy, easy peasy, mac and cheesy. We can take these guys, two or 3,000 men, and that will do this. Don't send up all of our people, just two or 3,000 men. But as we read, the soldiers of Israel were driven back in defeat and 36 of them were killed. 36 men lost in battle seemed insignificant in an army of 3,000. But here's what I'm gonna tell you why that's significant. And this defeat of Ai, the defeat by Ai, is the only defeat of the Israelites recorded in the whole book of Joshua. There is not one casualty mentioned outside of these 36 men in the whole book of Joshua. And after crossing the Jordan and after uh, taking the city of Jericho, in their minds was, we're, we're just moving on like God's, God's opening the doors for us. We'll take this city of Ai and it'll be no problem. But they found their defeat. Don't miss the contrast. They, they, here we've got Jericho, this huge city that was burned to the ground. Everyone had heard about it. Last week, Pastor Luke was talking about Rahab, the witness to her about what God was doing. God was with his people, he was for his people, and they were scared, and this testimony was going out that the God of Israel was winning the battles. So they just defeated Israel, everyone heard about it. Israel was unbeatable. They were undoubtedly at a national high, convinced of their invincibility and sure of victory. And then this little skirmish with Ai turns into a national disaster. Men die at the hands of a far weaker enemy. They said two or 3,000 people, so Joshua sends 3,000, and those 3,000 men retreated. They were soundly beaten by a small, weak army. And it says that the Israelites were paralyzed with fear and their courage melted away. What a turn of events. 
And Joshua reacts by immediately turning to God. It says that he tore his clothes, he put dirt on his head, and he throws himself on the ground face down before the Ark of the Covenant, and he prays a a self-centered prayer, a self-defeatist prayer, assuming the worst, assuming that this is all over. This is what he says. Oh, sovereign Lord, why did you bring us across the Jordan River if you're gonna let the Amorites just kill us? If only we had been content to just stay over there, none of this would have happened. Lord, what can I say now that Israel has fled from its enemies? We're running in fear. Everybody's gonna hear about this. They're gonna surround us. They're gonna defeat us. Our name is gonna be wiped out and your name is gonna be destroyed. This is what you've done to us, God. And I love how Joshua responds. But we see Joshua feeling like God has abandoned them. He's feeling this place of desperation. I don't know how many of you have ever felt that way. How many of you have ever felt abandoned by God? God, where are you? Where are you at? You feel alone, defeated, feeling like maybe God has tricked you. Maybe you've, maybe you've asked a question like this. Okay, God, you told me to do this. You commanded me to obey, and I did what I was supposed to. Now, where are you? You ever felt that way? This is how Joshua was feeling. So he's face down, whining and complaining to God. And I love what God says to him, this response of him in verse 10. But the Lord said to Joshua, get up. And I wonder how he said that. I wonder if he said, okay, Joshua, come on, let's get up. You think he said that? I think think his words to Joshua were, get up. Why are you laying face down with your face in the dirt? Come on, man. And essentially he's saying, stop feeling sorry for yourself. Stop wallowing in your self-pity and this poor me nonsense. Listen, there's sin here and we've got to deal with it. That's what's going on, Joshua. And God gives Joshua detailed instructions of how to deal with the sin, make amends, and get them back on track. Sometimes God is just that blunt with us. He says, look, You just need to stop sinning. The problem is, is we don't want to hear that. It's hard for us to hear God call us out and say, you're wrong, something's wrong. He's saying, come on, wise up. Yes, your life is a mess. Your life is a mess. The reason your life is a mess is because you've been messing around with things that I told you not to deal with, not to touch. Leave it alone. Don't go there. But you did anyway. And he tells us the same thing, get off your face, let's deal with it so that I can be in relationship again, so that I can bless you, so that I can fight your battle, so that I can bring you freedom and victory, so that I can accomplish my will in and through your life. I know it's not always that simple, it's not that black and white, it wasn't for Joshua. See, he had no idea what was going on. He had no idea that Achan had stolen the stuff, but God cut right through the chase and said, there's sin here. We need to deal with the sin. And I know that you know this, but sin destroys our fellowship with God. Evident right here in this this event, it keeps us from entering his presence and living life under his blessing. Sin will separate us from God and his presence. It's why our lives often fall short of what God desires for us, because we don't deal with our sin. What we do is we rationalize it. We try, to, we try to make excuses for it. We look around at others and decide, I'm not as bad as them. Try to compare ourselves. We look at society's standard of what is right instead of what God's standard of what is right. We decide that our sin isn't hurting anyone but maybe us. So what, what's, the, what's the big deal with that? And so we go through life with no power, with very little joy, without knowing the fullness and goodness of walking in a relationship with God. We miss out. We grieve God. We settle We get comfortable and we get blinded to the possibilities of what God can do and we end up merely existing instead of living life to the full. John 10, 10, the thief comes only to do what? Steal, kill, and destroy. The thief, our enemy, Satan himself, he's come only to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. It's time for us to get up. It's time for us to get off of our face, stop wallowing in our pity, and deal with the sin in our lives. I'm talking to every single one of us today. I think a problem with a nation is our churches don't take sin seriously anymore. 
And when our churches don't take sin seriously, it affects the community and it ultimately affects the nation. We need to get back to God and take serious what God says about who we are and how we're supposed to live. But yet we're flirting around like Achan and we see some things that are pretty and we say, oh, that won't hurt anything, I'll just take that. And and listen, the things that he took, he didn't even get to do anything with it. I mean, he couldn't put the coat on and wear it around there going, oh, Achan, where'd where'd you get that Babylonian jacket from? It's like he had to go bury it so that nobody else could see it. It did him no good at all, but he saw, he wanted it, and he took it. Even though God had spoken through Joshua to say, don't take a thing, or destruction is gonna come. Problems, you're gonna bring problems to the nation. So we need to take sin seriously. Listen, I believe that the cause of every bad thing is sin. It all originates with sin. I'm not saying that you sin personally and therefore X, Y, Z happened in your life. And not that every bad thing is a punishment for some particular sin that we've committed. There's something about sowing and reaping. But I'm not, I'm not saying that, that that way. I'm saying our world is contaminated. We live in a world that is sin sick. And we struggle through life facing all kinds of things that we would rather not face. There's pain, there's grief, there's rejection, there's disappointment, there's sorrow, there's heartache, there's tears, and it's all because of sin. Can I remind you that there won't be any of that in heaven? This is an opportunity for us to look upward and realize, hey, we're not living here forever. Jesus has a home for us in heaven and he's made a way for us if we will just follow him. We need to keep that in mind. And can we just take a moment to thank God for our future? We've got heaven waiting for us. For those of us who have given our lives to Jesus Christ, we've committed ourselves to him. We've been saved, we've been forgiven, we've been set free by his death on a cross, by his resurrection from the grave. We have heaven as our future home, as our reward, and that is our great hope that we live with today. And that should thrust us forward. We can face anything because we know we got the promised land right god will help us cross over any river any army whatever he can help us to get there he's got his promise for us that's why this story of ache and sin it's not just informative it's helpful to us it's not a message that we want to hear I mean, we would prefer to hear that our sin is nobody else's business, it only affects us, and it really isn't harming anyone. We just don't talk about it. There's some misunderstandings and some myths that we have about sin, and I wanna just go over a couple of those. First one is this, a myth or a misunderstanding that one sin won't hurt. One sin won't hurt. Achan probably thought his sin was so small and insignificant, it's no big deal. I saw the coat, I saw the silver, I saw the gold, I just thought, I'll take that and I'll, I'll, nobody's gonna miss that, no big deal. The truth is, one sin, one sin does hurt. Ask Adam and Eve, one moment, eternal separation from God. Moses, one sin kept him out of the promised land. Ananias and Sapphira instantly killed because they lied to the Holy Spirit. Misunderstanding too. My sin doesn't affect anyone else. It's just me, I'm not hurting anybody else. Maybe you've heard it like this. How I live my life and the things that I do is nobody's business but mine as long as I'm not hurting anyone else. You ever heard that before? Maybe you've said that before or at least thought that in your mind. Achan's sin affected an entire nation. And it was so costly. Stop and think about what a robe, some silver, and a bar of gold really cost. The families of 36 men and the entire nation of Israel suffered because of what? Sin, and the sin of one man. Listen to what happened, the result of one sin. 36 men died. 36 sets of families with children lost their fathers. 36 mothers lost their sons. 36 wives became widows. And scripture tells us that Israel's army became paralyzed with fear and lost courage, and this directly after the great battle of Jericho. In an instant, it just changed for them. Joshua is now questioning God. 
questioning God's intentions, his motives. Joshua, the man who had proven himself faithful and completely trusted God. That's why he was chosen to lead Israel. God threatened to withdraw his presence because of one man's sin. And ultimately, Achan and his family were stoned to death and their bodies burned. The consequences of one man's sin felt by everyone. Don't say, it's my sin and it doesn't affect anyone else. There is a ripple effect. And we're cool about it. We try to do our sin and when nobody else is around and think, okay, yeah, I can fool everybody. But listen, this would be sobering if for just a moment today, my life was a, a wide open screen for you to see what was going on in my life. Or if we could all look around and see what is the one thing that's going on in your life. That would make me wiggle a little bit. How about you? Misunderstanding or myth number three about our sin is that you can hide your sin. You can hide it. Achan really thought that the darkness of his tent would hide his sin and his disobedience. But listen to what Numbers 32, 23 says. Be sure that your sin will find you out. Somewhere, some way, somehow, it'll come out. You'll be found out. Proverbs 15, 3, the Lord is watching everywhere, keeping his eye on both the evil and the good. So even if we think nobody's watching, we know. I was raised with this perspective, God's always watching you. And I always thought of it like he's ready just to pound on me, you know. But the reality is that there's, there's help and strength and accountability in that. I know that God is with me. I know that he's watching me. Why would I want to do a detestable thing when I know that God's there? Think about, um, think about Joseph. What did Joseph say when um, he was propositioned by Potiphar's wife? Not that I would sin against Potiphar. He said, how could I do such a thing and sin against the Lord? That's what kept him from moving in that proposition with, with Potiphar's wife. You see, you might, we might think that we're pulling one over on God or if, if you have sin in your life, or convince yourself that he doesn't care. But we're not fooling him. We can't fool God. The reality is that he does care. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. We can't hide our sin, but we have one who knows us and he loves us. See, we can go to great lengths to cover up our sin, use extraordinary measures to do our sinning so that nobody will know. And it can get kind of ridiculous. But listen, this message that I want all of us to grasp today is this. God's way is far better. God's way is far better. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end leads in death. And John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, his way is not just a better way. Yes, it's far better than our own way, but his way is the only way. And the only way for us to overcome sin, the only way for us to win victory, the only way for, that we're ever gonna move forward is with him in our camp. And we've gotta be obedient to follow what he commands us to, follow, to do. It's just simple that we need to be obedient to God's plan and his purpose and his way. The last half of this chapter describes in a long press process that identifying who the guilty party was. And I don't know exactly why God did it this way. We're gonna bring this, uh, the, 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 all the tribes in and we're gonna pull out a tribe and then we're gonna go through all the clans of that, that tribe and then we're gonna go through all the families of, that, of each clan and then we're gonna pull up the individuals of that family and we're gonna find out who did this. I wonder, what if Achan would have just stepped forward and say, it's me? Guys, I, I, I don't know what I was thinking. He could have done that. And I wonder if things would have turned out differently. I can't imagine what Achan must have been feeling as all of this was going on and they're going by clan by clan, tribe by tribe, clan by clan, family by family, and each individual of that family. And I'm thinking, you know, as it gets closer to him and, and now his clan and now it's his family, I'm thinking, you just got, I, I don't think I could hold it together. But he waited to the point where Joshua said, Achan, 
What have you done? Tell the truth. Joshua knew. And Achan said, yeah, it's me. I saw and I wanted it so badly. And I took it and I hid it. That's the progression of sin in every one of our lives. I saw it. I lusted after it. I took it. Think of David and Bathsheba. He saw her. He lusted after her. He sent for her. And then he tried to cover it up. I don't know about Achan's case and what would have happened exactly. But I do know that the sooner that you and I face our guilt, the better it is for us. If we lie and try to cover it up and pretend that it isn't bad, we let somebody else take the fall for it, it only makes it worse. And when we hold on to our sin and refuse to give it up, we refuse to let the Holy Spirit come in to speak to us, to challenge us, to cleanse us, we sink deeper and deeper into sin and despair and further and further from the presence of God. I want to ask the worship team to come. See, Achan's sin wasn't just simply taking some things. It wasn't just the things that he took. They were commanded not to touch those things. But this is what God tells Joshua in verse 11. He tells um, what's at the heart of sin. He said, Israel has sinned and broken my covenant. In other words, what God is saying, what has happened is destroyed the relationship. That's what was wrong. There's a relationship that's been broken. Sin. We need to, we need to have a healthy perspective of sin and what it can do in our life. And this is, this is the thing God says, the, the covenant has been broken. It's a rejection of a relationship with God. We tend to think it's not that big a deal. It's just a little lie. It's just a picture on the computer screen. It's not gossip, it's just information. But when we start to see sin for what it really is and see it how God sees it and respond in a way that honors him. If you bow your heads and close your eyes, what I really want is for you to open your heart and say, Holy Spirit, what are you speaking to me? And I believe this, that I think the majority of people in the room, the Holy Spirit has already been touching on something in your life already. From the beginning of the message, this whole thing makes us a little bit uncomfortable. And the reason it's uncomfortable is because we don't want to be found out. Here's the, pro- here's the thing. Let's not let it get that far. God told Joshua, get up. Get off the ground, get your face out of the dirt, and let's deal with this thing and get it taken care of so that we can move on and experience victory. And that's what I believe he's saying to us today. Get up. Get your face out of the dirt. Get your face out of the TV. Get your face off of the computer. And let, get it on me. Let's deal with the sin. Let's expose ourselves rather than being exposed. Let's come to God and say, here I am. With nobody looking, your heads are bowed, and you would say today, Pastor Jeff, the Holy Spirit's been speaking something into my heart, and I know there's something in my life that's not right. There's something in your life that needs to be dealt with and it needs to be taken care of, and you're saying today, "Um, I need to let go of this thing. I need God to forgive me. I need him to come in and to clean me up to work in my life. And if that's you this morning, would you just raise your hand saying it's me? I don't know if you've been following Jesus all your life or you've never followed him, but you would say today, I need Jesus to clean up some mess in my life. And you just raise your hand and keep it raised. You know what, here's the thing. I, I promise you that every one of us in this room probably should raise our hand. I'm not telling you what to do, but let's stop ignoring it Let's stop putting it off. Let's listen to the Holy Spirit and let's deal with it. Let's get right with God because until we are right with God as Christians, until we are right with God as a church, we are not gonna have the effect in this community and around the world and in this nation 
without a right relationship with God. It's just a bunch of activity. So God, today you see our hands, you know our hearts. Deal with us, God. May we deal with this issue, this sin issue. Maybe that's, that's some, of, some of us are plagued with issues. But God, you're the answer. You died, you became sin for us so that we might become your righteousness. You took our sin upon yourself and became our sin. You died in our place. You already took care of it. Lord, we give it to you and we repent. We say no more. We want to turn from that sin and go the way that leads to you. So bring forgiveness, bring peace, bring strength, bring healing today to your people, to anyone today that's opening their heart to Jesus, saying yes to Jesus, to a relationship with Jesus. Would you just come and save and, and save them, God? Save their, save their soul. Forgive their sins. Heal them, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me this morning? Let's make this song as we, as we conclude, a song of consecration. It's talking about the altar. The altar is a place not just across the front of the church. The altar is a place wherever you meet with God. And I don't care if you're out on the street or you're at home or you're at work or whatever, and God speaks to you and calls your name and, and puts a finger on something in your life, right there in that moment can be an altar where you respond to God. Let's let our life be an altar before the Lord. Amen. So Jesus paid the penalty of your sin on the cross. But he didn't do that so we could just keep sinning and sinning. He has a plan and he has a purpose for your life. And your sin and your life, don't let the enemy confuse you, distract you. Don't let him make you believe a lie that you can do your thing and it doesn't affect anybody else. My sin could not only affect me, it could affect my family, it could affect this church, it could affect this community, and not just because I'm a pastor, the same way for all of us. Let's see it how God sees it. Let's respond to him and live in relationship with him day by day. God bless you. Thank you, guys. Sorry I kept you a little bit over. Have a great rest of your Sunday. Be back tonight, special time as we as we get into the Word again in Joshua. Spend some time in prayer. I hope that you'll be able to be back tonight, 6 o'clock right here.